and welcome back to the Criminal Defense Show, where we dive deep into the lives of criminal defense attorneys and learn from their unique experiences and journeys. Today, I have a very exciting guest joining me, Jerry Mason. He is a partner at Huffman Mason Rayner Stowers Attorneys. That was a mouthful, but we got through it. After a successful career as a sheriff, a SWAT officer, and a field supervisor, he's now focusing on DUI defense. He's known as the Kickin' Lawyer because he's a professional MMA fighter with a sixth degree black belt in Taekwondo. Wow. And he owns and runs multiple businesses, including a consulting service, which is a business consulting firm. We're very excited to have him on today. Welcome to the show, Jerry. Thanks. I appreciate you guys having me. I'm looking forward to it. Your bio sounds a little bit like the most interesting man in the world's bio. <laughs> well, my head, uh, my staff won't like hearing that because I think my head's big enough already, but I appreciate that. <laughs> very cool. Very cool. And I'm excited to get to learn even more about you today. So I want to get into a few different things about your practice and how you got to where you are. Tell me about your journey into the practice of law. Uh, I was a lifelong martial artist. I started martial arts when I was six because I got beat up real bad. And if you're in my office, everybody thinks I'm a big Superman fan because I've got Superman comic book stuff everywhere. But it's really not because I identified with Superman. I identified with Clark Kent because he was a nerd and it was powerful. So I really liked that. And um, anyway, so I got in martial arts and that was great for me because it taught me discipline and how even though you have, we all have our own personal battles to fight, that if you work hard, you have hard work, you can overcome those um, those weaknesses. And I ended up uh, getting appointed to the U.S. Taekwondo team when I was 18. I went to North Korea and fought in South Korea and China. In the course of that, I became a law enforcement officer, and I worked in multiple capacities in law enforcement. And then that leads to the divorce. I ended up getting divorced. I uh, was in a divorce with four kids and, you know, no issues to go into necessarily on there other than I was struggled with the reason that I, as what I thought was a good father, had to fight to get equal visitation with my children. And the reason that's important is I always remember what it was like being the client and not understanding what's going on. And you got these lawyers that seem to be so much wiser or more, you know, more intelligent than us or whatever, you know, they're in a world we don't understand. And uh, so I keep that sort of as my practice focus now to be very client centered uh, when they come in and need some assistance. Because you had that experience firsthand, what it feels like when you don't receive that, right? Yeah. Jerry, what have been some challenges that you faced at the firm as far as growing the practice goes? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, lawyers, I think, whether they have a business background or not, I think often they focus so much on ROI, on what's the immediate return on investment. And what I think lawyers can learn from people in the business world and, and other brands that we know is that like our product that we sell legal services, in some ways it's a commodity. So how do you set yourself apart? It has to be unique. Well, you have to make, it has to be top of mind. So if someone's in a car wreck, I want them to think the kicking lawyer. So I have to do, I have to have due diligence up front with brand, branding, build my brand uh, and it's not an immediate ROI. They won't, you know, they don't just see the billboard and call the billboard. They may not look at my social media uh, uh, presence and immediately call me, but I want to be top of mind, right? So uh, to sort of back up on how we got to the growth point, I think that's one thing that we did do really well was with the branding, the kick and lawyer brand and, and whatnot. And then, um, so now in this growth phase, there are several challenges we're facing. One is, you know, do you turn and work away? I mean, we were getting so many leads currently with our current uh, attorney numbers without just trying to overly hire people, which creates a whole nother problem. How am I going to service the clients I have? And then number two, how am I going to manage the people I have? You know, we, we're in a growth stage. You onboard new personnel. You try to keep the ones you got that are trained. That's an issue. And then, you know, because you're doing so well growth wise, you know, I have to make now in the next month a strategic decision. Do I move and have another office, another market because I've got so much reach? And, you know, and do I have policies and procedures in place to replicate to be just as successful in that new market? So we are definitely at a point where, um, you know, those are issues that I'm crossing. And, I, and as you mentioned before, I've, I've run several businesses or been a part of several businesses, but this is the first one that's had such exponential growth and probably partially because I've devoted all my time to this, the, the law practice. But at the same time, 
I've never had it where we were literally going to go regional. Most of the companies I've done before were very localized. Uh, we're my projection is in the next three to five years, if you want an attorney in West Tennessee, it's going to be the kick and lawyer they call. That's what we're looking at. The kick and lawyer idea is so good. How did you come up with that? Yeah. So when it started, well, first of all, as you mentioned, I got the background in martial arts. And so in the local community here, just sort of in this county area in Tennessee, I was known as the karate guy. So even as a law enforcement officer, that's how I got into law enforcement. The local sheriff wanted me to train his cops. And so uh, when I went in to train them in defensive tactics, I was teaching them to like jump kick in the face and stuff, which you can't just do. But I didn't know that. I wasn't a cop. So then I was like, uh, all right, I got to learn the cop stuff. So I became a reserve to sort of learn their use of force continuum. And from there, um, at the time, all I did is I was a karate teacher and I needed insurance and stuff. So I was like, cool, I, I can teach four hours at a, a night and still work an eight or 10 hour shift as a deputy and get, get insurance. That was the whole plan originally. So I got into the, uh, the law enforcement sort of that way. And the whole time, though, I was known as the kicking lawyer because even then I started fighting in mixed martial arts. I had done kickboxing. That's what I was known as. And I was real good at building, again, at least locally. Um, I wanted to be the karate guy because I wanted people to come, you know, train at my martial arts school. Same thing, building that business. And I was selling a service, martial arts instruction, similar to legal services. So fast forward, then when I get in control of this law firm, I knew that to go to the next level, I had to compete with the big boys, the people that you see on TV and the people that are doing all these different things that are very expensive though. You know, and in the beginning stages, we didn't have the money to compete with them dollar for dollar. So I was like, how can I make it unique? How can we stand out amongst this super crowded market, especially in Memphis? How can we, we stand out? And so I, I initially was going to be the black belt lawyer. That was what I initially looked at, but that was taken. Now they weren't doing much with it, but it was the, the website at least was taken. So I kept doing some more searches. And so then the kicking lawyer, I had that idea or kick lawyer or something like that. Um, and initially I, I had the G on it, but we're in the South. I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> and so sort of a Southern take on anything with an ING is just kicking, you know, with an I-N. Yeah. And I thought, that's going to hit home to my clientele better. And then I, I guess another thing I should back up and tell you is when I analyzed all this, I always consider first, who's my market? Who am I marketing to? I wasn't trying to get the CEO of FedEx as a client. You know, I wasn't trying to get uh, all these businesses as clients initially. I was trying to get you know, the normal average citizen who goes to work nine to five, got a DUI, got picked up for having some weed, you know, whatever, got into it with their spouse. That was my, the blue collar worker was my client. So I knew that something unique like that, especially if I made fun of myself. So I'm not saying that everybody should do this, but I knew that if I made fun of myself, I had the mini pig, whiskey, the law hog thing with me on the logo and all that, that that would strike home with them because I could be relatable. And that's what I wanted to be. And I am like, I have people in this area, people message me constantly. Like we've debated hiring an assistant for me just to field the leads that I get on my personal Facebook page or people have my number and message me. It's just, con so a, a large portion of my day is managing the, the leads that come in. But that was sort of the root of the kicking lawyer. And um, you, you may or may not know this or want to know this, but our firm has really two brands that I push because the kick and lawyer was doing really good blue collar workers. But then I started to get people that were in the business world that were really interested in our firm helping on their marketing side. And then also maybe some hiring clientele. So we had the HMRS attorneys, because you're right, Huff and Mason Rainer Stowers is a mouthful. So we had the HMRS attorneys brand that we also kind of push together, but separately because they're both sort of a different demographic of a client. Gotcha. I think it's so important what you said about identifying who your target audience is when you're coming up with what that brand is going to be. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a cornerstone. I just did an article for one of the, ta the, the Tennessee state, um, uh, it's tactile, Tennessee Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And, uh, and, and that article, what I did was on marketing. And that's one of the first things I said you have to determine because, you know, if you're a bankruptcy attorney, your market may be different. If you're trying to do blue collar criminal defense work, it's different. If you're trying to do federal court criminal defense work, it's a little different. And so each client is going to react differently. I, I'll give you one other example. So I'm, I'm the COO of a, a company called Badger's Laser Solutions that I have some other law, uh, other not law partners, 
other partners with. And uh, in that company, it's an industrial laser measurement company, right? So I'm in it because I run the marketing and the uh, business side and the per all similar stuff that I do with the, the law firm. But I don't market it anywhere near like I market this other stuff. Most people don't even know it exists. And the reason is we're marketing to the in to industrial clients, to big industry. So the way I market to them is different. Um, so yeah, you're, you're right. I think it's vitally important that as a uh, attorney, if you're trying, you know, and it all depends on the goal. Some people are fine being, um, you know, working nine to five or not even that. I've got a friend in a, a local city who she's a, an attorney and she's fine. She's like, this is how much money I want to make. I'm capped at this much money. I'm only going to work four days a week. I'm only going to do, that's fine. Well, I work seven days a week, 10, 12 hours a day. Usually I work out three hours a day. I don't sleep much. And the reason is, is I know where I'm going. I'm going to this next level that a lot of people don't care to go to. It, it, it's going to be trying and stressful, but that's just how I'm built. That's where I'm going. Um, but I figured out about three years in really where my strengths and weaknesses were and decided instead of fighting against them or doing components of legal practice that I don't like is I would ally with people that made me strong so that I could do what I'm good at. Yeah, that makes total sense. Well, I'm curious, when did you guys make the move from managing everything in-house to hiring like a third-party marketing company to help carry some of the load with the marketing stuff? Yes. So early on when we realized we needed some more, cause, cause I have an MBA, but that doesn't mean I know how to do SEO. You know, I have an MBA, uh, but that doesn't mean that I need, and I'm the managing partner, but that doesn't mean that, that the best use of my time is doing a Facebook post. You know what I mean? So yeah. if the way I look at it is I always analyze each task and I say, is this the best thing for my time? Is this my, or is this something I can delegate? And so I started to realize, man, some of these tasks I can delegate. And then some of them are somewhat technical. Um, and you have to recognize expertise where it is. Uh, I consider myself pretty much an expert on DUI litigation, and I think I'm pretty good at marketing, but there's a lot of these other components I don't know. So I realized that we had to ally with people that were better than we were, and you either hire them outside to come in and deal with the headache of payroll and HR management, or you get uh, you know a, a partner company kind of like you guys to come in and maybe take that weight off of you, and then hope that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. And we've been blessed so far. You guys have done more than I uh, anticipated, so we've been very pleased. Good. What marketing practices are you currently following? Like, what channels are you using right now? Yeah. So I have. Uh, I look at it two ways. I consider marketing. Uh, sort of, we're working on a split, and we're not all the way one way or the other. I have what I call old school. Uh, streams of marketing, and then the new school streams of marketing. So old school would be like your billboards, your print advertisements, even television advertisements, uh, or if anybody listens to radio, radio advertisements, right? So that's sort of the old school wing. And because um, we're in a, and the reason I say we're in a split is my perception is, you know, we're not to the level where all the generations that are used to that, that type of marketing are gone. So that those generations are still around, you know, they're still here, they still buy, they're still consumers. And so you got to do some things in that revenue stream or in that uh, marketing stream uh, to, if you're trying to net in some of those uh, clients, then you've got the new stream on the other side, which is your, mostly your internet stuff, your websites, your, your internets, uh, pay-per-click, whatever, um, all that kind of, all that wing and the majority of our revenue goes towards that wing now because that's the buying power. And over the next, you know, five to 10 years, that's going to be all the buying power. So if I had to tell you how we split our marketing dollars, it's probably 25 to 30% for the old school wings. And then the rest goes to the, the internet side now for us. Good. And how, how willing are you to pivot and change things when need be? Like if a new thing comes up, and you want to allocate more of your budget to that, are you guys pretty quick to adapt things like that? Or does it take a little bit more time to phase into that? We are quick to adapt, but I don't like to look too much at the rest of the market because I like to be original. I like to be the, uh, the, the trendsetter, so to speak, and then have other people copy us. Like, for example, we just did a comic book. I got a Kick and Lawyer comic book coming out. And it's got all the other lawyers in it and they got little uh, comic book names in it. But I'm using it for multiple purposes. It's clearly marketing, right? But in it, it teaches a life skill for a kid. So a kid that's in third, fourth grade, they're reading a book and it teaches like the first one teaches how to show confidence, right? Um, but then it also sells our brand. It's got uh, HMRS, the whole team in it. We're all marketed sort of as superheroes. And I noticed John Morgan, 
I did this a month ago, has now got a superhero marketing thing that he's doing. So uh, he must be taking a look too, but that's fine. Um, and then, oh, by the way, the only way to get the comic book is they have to donate to charity. They donate to charity, bring us proof, we give it to them. We don't sell any, none of my swag is sold. All my swag is given away if they do, you know, certain things. Because again, you know, again, it's ROI. You have a lot of lawyers who are like, I don't want to spend money on that, on all that stuff. It costs me money and, you know, I'm just giving it away. But they don't realize that's branding, that's product placement, you know, yeah. and it's sad to say, but that kid, you know, in 10 years might need our services. You never know. So, um, uh, yeah, we, we do a lot of unique things, regardless of the market, I would say, just because I feel like I kind of have my pulse on the consumer because it circles back to what we just talked about. If you identify your key client, then, uh, you know, you can get into their skin, so to speak, and know what it is that motivates them, what it is that drives their buying habits. And, and then, you know, you, you'll be in front of them. So when they need that lawyer, you're the guy. A comic book that ties in with your persona as the kick in lawyer. It's such a creative idea. And I think that's something that everyone needs to take away from this. Like, think about how you can get creative. And if you don't have a creative bone in your body, find a Jerry. Well, I want to talk a little bit more about your experience with mixed martial arts. How do you think that skill has made you a better lawyer and a better business owner? Well, so I, I operate daily in my life by the sort of this mantra of if I haven't done it or if it makes me uncomfortable to think about doing it, then I should do it. And the reason I think life is about experience. And I think most people, a lot of people live life and then all of a sudden it's past them. And I always had this vision that I don't want to be 90 and laying there potentially on my deathbed and then have regrets, you know, like Sean Connery just passed away. And that man lived a life. That he guy did. died like a dude at 90 in the Bahamas after living the life he lived, died in his sleep. So, you know, that's like my goal. Like, that's the way I want to go. I want to have done all this stuff. So anyway, like running for alderman or fighting martial arts or any of that, if it makes me uncomfortable, then I think it's something we should try to do. And I think it makes me a better trial lawyer also. Um, because, you know, think about it. If, if you're fighting another human, this other human wants to hurt you, right? So, and I have to have ill intent towards them. But that's a very un uncomfortable situation. There are a lot of lawyers that sh shy away from jury trials because those are stressful. I mean, you've got another person's freedom in your hands in a criminal jury trial. But if you've done things like go to North Korea, uh, I fought a Shaolin monk on the streets of Beijing, got whipped by the Shaolin monk, um, fight in a cage with another human, then, then that's not quite as big a deal. And so I can be more authentic at trial. And I think it comes off better with the jurors because a trial is really, you're selling an argument. You're selling your clients, innocent, the weakness and the evidence, you know, whatever it is, but it's a sales pitch. And, you know, people don't believe fake salesmen. You have to come off very authentic. And so I'm just my authentic, true self because I really don't get nervous about many things. Uh, you may find this interesting. Uh, I just did, we just closed at the local theater here doing the Rocky Horror uh, Show production. I don't know how familiar you are with that. I played Rocky. Oh my gosh. basically naked singing role, role, right? That is amazing. It's There's internet pictures. You can find them. You're fearless, Jerry. That's impressive. I don't know about that. I don't like snakes and I'm afraid of my wife. So... <laughs> <laughs> two things. It takes a lot though to get up in front of an audience, a live audience and nothing but your skivvies on Halloween. I mean, whoa. <laughs> well, I, think. I didn't think it was that big a deal. It was fun. That sounds like my worst nightmare, honestly. <laughs> I can't believe <laughs> you did that. It That's amazing. That's what you should do. That's your goal. <laughs> yeah. Start a play. That'll be my next goal, Kelly. Um, well, one of the things that I was really excited to talk to you about today, Whiskey the Law Hog. Tell people who that is. If you watch the Kick and Lawyer commercials, so you go to YouTube, just search, search Kick and Lawyer, the commercials are on there. And uh, the, we've got, you know, the normal lawyer ones, and then we got the sort of the Whiskey the Law Hog ones. And they're, they're kind of funny. And Whiskey the Law Hog is kind of the Kick and Lawyer sidekick, right? So in the commercials, I'm hanging out with Whiskey, we're buddies and whatnot. Well, the way that came about is my wife, while I was in law school, right, actually first year I got out of law school, she wanted a French bulldog, Okay. Well, I'm, and we're dog people, okay? Like, while well, I've got uh, a rescue bulldog and we've got a little, uh, I always call it a little girly dog. I don't know what it is, but I got this little dog. Anyway, <laughs> so we like the dogs, but uh, French bulldogs are like three grand. And this was pre-kicking lawyer success days. So three grand wasn't going to happen. 
Mm-hmm. So I found in Bald Knob, Arkansas, these mini pigs. And I was like, women love mini pigs. So I went to I went to Bald Knob, Arkansas. She thought she was getting a French bulldog. I had my kids with us. They were all excited. And we pull up. She's so excited to get a French bulldog. And this dude comes out with these pigs. And uh, to her credit, she played it off and acted like she liked it. So she got a, a mini pig. And I got a whiskey. We named the kids named it whiskey. They named it. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember why they named her whiskey. It wasn't because I drink whiskey. It was something else. But anyway, they named her whiskey the log. My kids named the, the pig. Well, the law hog thing came in because at that point, when I got licensed and first iteration of partnerships here, we were going to move into Arkansas. And so it was all a marketing thing that Arkansas has the Razorbacks, the Arkansas Razorbacks, and mm-hmm. they're all big about them. Just like in Tennessee, people are crazy about the volunteers, right? Anyway, so I was like, let's do whiskey, the law hog. And I literally took professional pictures with me and the pig hanging out because I was going to push into Arkansas with the law hog, right? Well, we ended up deciding not strategically to go into Arkansas, but I still had this pig. So so she's up to 80 pounds. And uh, my understanding is she's probably full grown at 80 pounds, we hope. Um, She can't go downstairs because she can't see, but she can go upstairs. So we had to build her a ramp. So she's got her own ramp. She's got her own little bed area. She's like a little kid. She's not just the the mascot of the firm. She's a part of your family, right? She's like my kid. She hates me, so it's good. (laughs) She fits (laughs) right in then. (laughs) Well, what kind of feedback have you gotten from clients and just the community about having whiskey as the mascot? How does that tie in with your brand? Yeah. So the hog, the law hog was probably a, a better component than me. Well, I'll give you an example. We have a heritage festival in this area. It's a real big thing in this community. And I always have several booths. I have several of my companies up there. And I was, of course, running for alderman. So I had a uh, uh, like a wagon and I put Whiskey the Law Hog and the Kicking Lawyer on the side of the wagon and pulled her around. Well, when I would go try to talk to people about the alderman thing without the pig, you know, it was like normal. Nobody really wanted to talk about the election stuff. With the pig, people come to me like they all and they had seen the commercials and they wanted their picture with the pig. They didn't care about the kicking lawyer. They so the pig was a big component. It, it's also an icebreaker. You know, it's a good way to break ice. People come in the office and want to meet the pig. Like they'll come to our law firm just to meet Whiskey the Law Hog. Well, that's a great idea. I mean, again, with the creativity, like these are things that not a lot of people think about. You just have to get creative. You know, a lot of these lawyers think they have to be Mr. Lawyer or Miss Lawyer and be all. But you know what? The consumer has changed than it was 20 or 30 years ago. You know, we've got to compete for the position to be top of mind. And so you've got to be unique. So, Jerry, one of the interesting things about you, besides everything else we've already talked about, is the fact that you also have another business, that you're a business consultant. Tell us about that. Uh, so many of the things I mentioned before, I found that um, other businesses just either don't do or don't know how to do. So I started initially with this Kicks Consulting thing. Um, just to, well, to circle way back, I started training kids because one of my goals was to keep businesses in our community. And and we're north of Memphis. We're a we're a separate county from Memphis, and so we lose a lot of quality business owners workers, entrepreneurs to Memphis or to surrounding areas. And so I wanted to make sure kids knew how to uh, set up a business, how to have a business plan, a marketing plan, the types of businesses, just, you know, just basics, how to do a budget, things like that. And so I sort of did this kicks consulting college thing where over a weekend, high school kids would come in, I'd teach them this stuff. Well, then I started finding that it wasn't just the high school kids. There are you know, business owners, existing businesses that don't know how to do a lot of this stuff. And as the kicking lawyer thing started to catch catch traction, we started to get calls from businesses that wanted me to help them with their branding and marketing. I love it. Well, as a business consultant, what's the number one most valuable piece of advice you could give people? Oh, man, number one. Uh, I, it's hard to narrow it to one. I would say two main things that are both equally important. Number one is you cannot undersell branding. If you're in a, any business that's arguably a commodity, whether you're a, a, a restaurant owner or a lawyer or whatever it is, you know, branding is very, if you're going to grow, branding is very essential and powerful. And you've got to understand what it takes to build a brand. And you have to avoid the concern, the initial concern of looking at dollar for dollar return on investment. 
because you're just not going to get initial return on investment, and in my head anyway, on most branding. If you get a new website, it's going to take time for it to build traction. If you put a billboard up, it's going to take time for that to, to build. So that's number one, I would say, is make sure you understand branding, what your brand is. And, you know, there's other questions behind that that we've already discussed. Who's your market? You know, what are your strengths and weaknesses? How can you fill those so that that plan is set before you push the brand? And then the second thing is, you know, you just got to do it. You can't be afraid. Uh, I don't care what business it is, but you just got to put yourself out there and we're going to grow. You're going to be successful as an attorney. You have to get clients. Well, there's other lawyers competing for those same clients. So how are you going to stand out and be unique? Well, good. Well, it has honestly been such a pleasure talking with you today, Jerry. I thank you for taking the time to join us. If you want to check Jerry out, you can go to his website, jerrymason.com. That's J-E-R-E mason.com. And people can also look up your YouTube channel, right, Jerry? Yeah. And it's under my name or anytime you Google or put anything in a search engine, kick and lawyer without the G, K-I-C-K-I-N lawyer, then you'll find me on Instagram, Facebook, any of that stuff. And I'm open. Uh, if anybody watches this and wants some general direction on stuff, I enjoy this stuff. So it's not like you got to pay me to call and speak with me about something. You know, if we go that route later, we can. But initially, I'm all about I'm very motivated to help people develop their own brands and marketing. And so I'll be glad to help uh, anybody. It's a very kind offer. And I hope one people will take you up on. You've got a lot of value and a lot of knowledge. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you guys having me. It's been fun. It has been. We're so glad you took the time today. And if you found today's episode helpful, please do us a solid and share it with people in your circle. You can also check out the notes on today's show over at our website, www.scorpion.co without the end. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time.